Hi, as a local emergency department doctor and worker of the front lines of the pandemic, I'm sure that Dr. Gordon Reed and of course Dr. Yana have seen the negative impacts of GP shortages, nursing shortages, and overall the neglect of the healthcare system in Australia. Through policy, funding and legislation, how do you think that we should approach this problem moving onwards? I might start if that's okay. Mm. Um, thank you, Kira, so much for your question. Um, and we know that uh, GP shortages um, and, and healthcare staff shortages have really contributed to the pressure that our state hospitals are under. Um, so I continue to practice in the emergency department and see the result of that. Um, and one of the... Uh, we look at the amount of medical students that are currently selecting general practice, which is around that 10 to 12 per cent mark, um, I believe. So it's, it, it's at historic lows. Um, and I think we really need to um, ascertain as to why that is the case. Um, I do think that um, remuneration is part of that conversation. Um, GPs, on average, are paid less than other medical specialties. Um, and part of that is looking at the structure of how GPs are paid, including bulk billing. So in the recent, uh, in the recent budget, we found that um, uh, what we needed to do is we tripled the bulk billing incentive. Um, so that people can access the healthcare when they need it, um, and the partial re-indexation of bulk billing. So that will help contribute to that. Um, and then too, there's um, how do you retain? How do you retain those GPs once they're already in the training program? How do you retain them in the area that they're in, rather than going back to sort of where they came from? So if you grew up in the centre of Sydney. Um, and then you go and be a GP registrar for a little while on the Central Coast or Newcastle, but mm -hmm. you want to go home, how do we keep them in our regions or even further afield? Um, so we look at some of the incentive payments that there are um, to keep GPs in those, uh, in those more rural and remote areas. So the, the way that that's classified is the modified Monash scale, so the four to seven, so keeping them in those areas. Um, and then to also working with medical students and universities um, about the, the benefits of working in general practice or rural generalism as well. So whether that be through the RACGP or whether that be through ACRAM, which is the College of Rural and mm. Remote Medicine. So making sure that medical students are really exposed to that breadth of what generalism is. Because general practice is one of the most difficult specialties that you can undertake as a doctor. You have an undifferentiated patient, meaning you have no idea what is wrong with the patient in mm. front of you, and then you have to figure out what's going on, and then you either treat that on the spot, you refer on, or they're going to need some acute care at that point. So you're not only making the clinical decisions in the moment, but you're also thinking, well, how else do I better treat this patient? And that's, that's one of the hardest things that we do in healthcare with those undifferentiated patients. So I think it's a conversation about remuneration, it's a conversation about the training and education of medical students and general practitioners as registrars, and really it's working with the peak bodies that represent um, generalists, so the Royal College of yeah. General Practitioners and the College of Rural and Remote Medicine. Diana? I think you've highlighted it perfectly. Main, the main issues that are associated. Obviously, you and I have come out of medical school at different times, but I look at majority of my friends who don't want to go into general practice because they're being pushed remotely as the only options mm. for them to train. Mm. So one of my closest friends got a rejection letter from RAC GP last week. She is the most, one of the most competent doctors I've ever met, but because she has three children in schools right now, she cannot move out of her local metro area, and the only option she had was to go remotely. However, if they offered her a big financial remuneration to... Act, you know what I'm trying to say? Yeah. A package of money... <laughs> <laughs> a large package of money! Money. <laughs> if they gave a reason or an incentive for the doctors perhaps who don't have family to go remotely or as part of their contract encourage them to go and train in a rural and remote region, perhaps some of the families that have to stay or the more localised people would. I think one of the biggest problems though is that, as you said, from a... Rem I can't say that word. Remumination? <laughs> <laughs> when, when you look at the money... When you look at the money. If you go to a GP and they get paid maybe 25 bucks for that consult, mm. but you go and have a massage and it's $80 and people don't seem to have a problem for paying that. We need to change that conversation with our community that a GP is worth the value in actually seeing them because so many of my other friends that are GP trainees or GP um, skilled consultants already are struggling to pay the mortgage. So what incentive does a medical student have when all of the bosses and the senior supervisors they talk about can barely put food on the table, who are struggling to decide when to have children in that lifestyle because moving remotely may be the only option for them for their career. But yet, in, in, in why are they not... Move, let's talk about why they're not wanting to remove, move remotely. 
Mm. Because out there it's dangerous, yeah. because patients die, because there's mm. not enough medical support for them, because there's not enough nurses, because there's not enough funding in, in, mm. in that environment, that I literally sat there and decided, do I go Akram training and become a GP obstetrician or do I become a GP, sorry, to become an obstetrician in the city? I don't want to be out there where a woman dies on my, my watch when I don't have the support and training to be, to, to be there. So somehow we actually need to do a blanket change right now where we go into medical schools and right at the beginning we actually put them into a bonded program, which you know exists, mm. to be GPs already, not just necessarily doctors of any type of specialty because all those other specialties let's be honest are very sexy financially neuro no they are yeah, they guys are. I'm just mm. being yeah. really honest yeah. a neurosurgeon a cardiologist an obstetrician which is what I'm studying to be they're really wonderful terms and don't get me out <coughs> they're wonderful but they're not sustainable long term because all of a sudden we're not going to have the, the general GP the family doctor who actually diverts their patients to us if we don't have the right system in place in the first in, right now so I feel like we need to inject a huge amount of money right now into the next five years of pretty much saying creating a creating a medical school that is just general practitioners in other words you get in you don't you, that's your choice that's your pathway make it a specialty that is so sexy in its own that all these people are then wanting to go out rural and wanting Yana to go out Pittman has fiction. called for <laughs> GPS to be sexy again <laughs> <laughs> I love it and it's it's true. As, as a GP addict, my, you I hi to my doctor. Um, here she is again. But uh, the health economics here, obviously the government's been trying to make some shifts, but they're going to need to... This is going to need a broader overhaul, isn't it? Uh, well, certainly... Um... Uh, to tackle the kind of numbers question, I think, you know, we, we've sort of looked at this and when you look at a macro level, um, it's, it's not clear that we actually have shortages of GPs and nurses overall. So we actually compare pretty favourably to a lot of developed countries in the numbers per 1,000. Uh, the key challenge, which, which both have pointed to, is the distribution. Yeah. Um, and, you know, so you, you go out to regional New South Wales or, um, you know, northwest Melbourne, you know, there's, there's pockets of cities and pockets of regions um, even where we... Even and, and, like, Blue Mountains and Blackheath don't even have doctors at the moment. Yeah, this is there's exactly. one GP in Blackheath that's actually working. One, my parents live in Taree and they have one GP and they can't see them for four months. Yeah, like so if there's a critical this, health condition, like that's this crazy. This is the problem. Um, and, and this is why I think when we think about the policy solution, it's probably less of the blanket stuff uh, and more of the kind of localised yeah. interventions. Uh, and Yana's point about kind of building the team around the GP is important. You know, just sending someone alone out to a, a regional community, um, you know, does feel scary and does feel exposed. So we actually need governments doing this kind of place-based local interventions, helping set up the clinic underwriting the salary of that doctor, building the team around them. Uh, if we're going to put money into it, I think that's what we need to do. And that's the only way we're going to deal with these kind of equity and access issues. Mm. Yeah, I think you guys are the experts. So I'm not going to <sighs> comment on the training, but regional and in my, my electorate's about an hour, hour and a half out of suburban Mel or out of the CBD of, Mel of Melbourne and has trouble attracting doctors mm. and GPs. So I agree that with the significance. And I think the question in the short term is what other opportunities are there? I know pharmacists are talking about, can they take some of the pressure off yes. GPs? Yep. And I think that's, again, something we should look at. Immunisation yep. and a few other things. Um, mm. One of the other things that we don't talk about a lot is the technological opportunities. And I had the amazing opportunity here from an AI company, Harrison AI, that are you, uh, using AI to triage radiology, scans, CAT scans and X-rays and things, highlight the main risks that would be there. And then the, the trained professional is reviewing that. But what it means is they've got eight hours in a day. They're focused on the most important, most urgent scans. And they look at the whole scan, but they know roughly where to look. So how do we use technology and med tech and how can we speed up the process around med tech while making sure it's safe, recognising that a delay of six to 12 months to unlock a med tech opportunity is actually an, an economic opportunity cost and a medical opportunity cost right now. And, and how can we be smarter as well as get get training and support GPs? Mm -hmm. Telehealth as well. Yeah, well, Tamworth Hospital is doing that now. Yeah. So their ED department actually runs, instead of waiting four or five hours to see a doctor, they triage yeah. their patients and then they have an online option. So they, they are trying to look at yeah. ways yeah. to expand that. Telehealth, other yeah. options. Yeah, we're yeah. in this new digital world. How can we take some pressure off and not just focus on how much we spend, but the outcomes that we're delivering, because ultimately that's what the health system should be delivering outcomes for patients and the community. Jesse, I know you, I mean, you had a baby two months ago and you're here. <laughs> yes. So, wow. Yeah. Um, I was um, broken on the couch after my first child. Um, 
and yeah, the baby was raising me already, <laughs> as she still does. Uh, I know you recently actually had a hospital experience. Yes, I did. And what happened um, there? It was the funniest hospital experience. So I was uh, had my baby and then about six weeks later I had a complication with stitches. I won't go into it. We'll talk backstage. Okay. Um, <laughs> so I had an issue with stitches and I ended up in emergency and I was laying there and I had a sort of gyno come in and I went, I, I know your face. Have I interviewed you for work? What is it? And I was sitting there going, mm, don't know. I'd had some painkillers. I had no idea. Anyway, she treated me examination, internal, external, whole thing. And then I went home later and I went, that was Yana Pittman. Oh, <laughs> <no>. <laughs> that was Yana Pittman, the Olympian. <laughs> and I then I got an email. <laughs> Yeah. I got an email um, the next day from my publicist saying um, Q&A, because after that I was like, when am I going to see Yana again? Like, <laughs> and then she was like, Q&A um, is coming up. We've got one panellist in and it's, it's Yana Pittman. And I was like, no, 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 no. Um, So because of the shortage, I might have a chat backstage. We might follow up. Um, and just see how it's all going. Just a little check up. Just too. a check up. Uh, see how things are going. <laughs> I'm always on call, yeah. Does that She's happen to you all the time She's where people are like, hang on a minute, you hear that woman from the Olympics? <laughs> With their legs like this and up in their vagina. <laughs> <laughs> it's great. And you're like, <laughs> you don't want to recognise your gyno. You don't. <laughs> don't do so much. <laughs> for my future career. <laughs> anyway, she was, away she was a wonderful doctor with an excellent 10 out of 10. <laughs> 10 out of 10. So I'm here today, aren't I? So thank you for your help and I wish I never saw you again. Also, <laughs> how small is this country exactly? Uh, like, what, what are the chances? I hadn't come across Yana. I, I was like, the, the SAS, yeah. I'd seen her around. Oh, but I no. didn't think I would ever sit on a panel trying to act smart in front of the person who was treating me two weeks ago. <laughs>